I remember um, when we first started doing the song, we got invited for some free time in the studio, and we started working on Icy Red. And I came up with that kind of drum beat, um, but it was a hard beat to keep up and keep going. And I remember we were trying to do some takes at this place, and I was struggling. And, and Tim came up to me and kind of very nicely gave me a little warning, you know, just you can kind of do this. It's like, you know. Anyway, I overcame it and I managed to somehow get through that track and, and just hearing it again recently on the record and trying to emulate and play along with it, boy, it's, it's, I did it hard, <laughs> didn't realise. Oh, we ended up, rec yeah, we ended up recording in Ringo, sorry. Um, that was probably about a, I don't know, a year or two later. I went there, I was completely blown out by the place, absolutely stunning, fancy stuff, you know. And something I kind of got into was I remember walking around the house and I saw the bedrooms and where John used to sleep with Yoko and he had a patch bay on the wall that he could just plug his guitar into and they could start playing downstairs. For some reason we experimented, um, I, I was in the hall, I was put in a hallway on my own um, to get a big drum sound and everyone was in different places, you know, I think the, the Finns were probably in the control room. Um, Nigel was actually out walking the grounds, he had a lead on him about half a mile long. And it's very bizarre, I don't know if any musicians who might be hearing this has ever played without people around them, you know, not to a click track or anything, it's, it's like a whole other sense taken away and it's quite a weird experience. <laughs> So um, yeah, this was quite a, a new thing for me. I've never done anything quite like this before. So I ended up playing it like this. Um, you got the bass drum camera on? Um, something like. Something like that. I chose to play it like that. I probably tried it different ways. Probably I would have started like. There's a different feel when you do it this way. And there's a different sound when you do it this way. So um, I presume I did it that way uh, because it would be too hard to play all the way through that fast. And then I realised there's a certain feel and a certain groove and you start to just shape it out, I suppose. I find with speeds, they generally find themselves naturally. Um, and there's two coordinates to that. You've got just obviously your basic feel, how it feels to play your instrument and how it swings and bounces. But the real big one to get the speed right is about the singer, because he's singing the song. And, um, and it's important that he's comfortable with the words. So it's just understanding those two. So usually there is a natural kind of tempo then for a song. Okay, look, this is um, a thing about, you know, you've got to be playing at a fair volume. But you'd get going and it would just have a momentum of its own. And that was the only way I could play that bass drum fast and hard. And it was interesting, I was just trying to play it the other day um, in the same way as I played it on the record. And um, my pedal actually broke and I put my spare out. I couldn't keep up. I mean, it was just, it wasn't, far, it wasn't going fast enough for me. So um, it was a real, it's a real momentum thing. It's like you just sit on the edge and ride the board and your body weight and you, you, your feet, they just kind of go and, and it has to be like that. Any tensions, you're in trouble. So there's a bit to work out because I'm doing things like... Um, little crossover, but when you're going that fast, you've got to find your way to do them where it flows and it's fairly invisible. So th this was another tension thing where, like you were saying earlier, that you, you can ride on the tom, you're hitting a frequency, you're not really interfering with anybody else or the whole middle to upper frequency. So suddenly when you come in just on a high hat, boy, it's a huge dynamic out of doing nothing. And that's how I played the song really. So it went from contrast to contrast. 
So it went from, whoops, classic verse to, and then into uh, an uplifting chorus. Because it's a bit of a white noise sound, so it just lifts up and then shoo, back to that dark tension. So I got three steps to go up in the most simplest of ways, just from, with the effect still of a, just a casual crash. That's very powerful. So as I said, I'm just trying to utilize things simplistically. So when they happen, they happen and they have impact rather than just every four bars or eight bars or cymbal or, or whatever it may be. There is method to the madness. <laughs> Um, look, this is Neil's first time around, really. I mean, he just kind of come at age as a songwriter. He'd only been in the band, I don't know, maybe a couple of years. Uh, and they're young and they're fresh, and he's got a whole different style of writing as to Tim. I think Neil is usually a little bit more simplistic. Because I remember when I joined the band in 76, late 76, um, I'd never really been in a band that I wanted to be in because I wasn't quite good enough. By the time I joined Split Ends, I was playing um, all the stuff from uh, mental notes, which is all the complex stuff. I loved it. I mean, it was just very powerful and melodic and atmospheric. I fell in love with their music. And for me to play that stuff was like playing all the fantasies that I've never had a chance to play, you know, with other bands and favourite kinds of music because the time changes and the ambience and such great players, you know. The point was that was our most complex time. I had a chance to get all my fantasies out of it and, and, and play and tour the album. And then after that, it's a bit like we're starting from scratch again. And I say that was our turning point really, where the um, complex stuff, which was on the outside beforehand, suddenly went on the inside. So it's instantly very accessible at that point. And I, so, I suppose it shows because, I mean, it is timing too, but you know, it was a huge, huge album, that one. So I was getting more and more down that road and I was starting to hold back, like not hit symbols, particularly in the obvious places. Not just for the sake of it, I was trying to be a little bit different, I suppose. But just to release tension, so one more time around, it'd be, oh, there's another round to do. And finally, just when you go, oh, gee, been waiting for that. That was my idea anyway. As I said, I think I'm a simpler drummer. I'm more of a musical, moody drummer. I love atmosphere. And I think about it. Um, hence, I'm quite mindful where I use my cymbals and, and what I use. Um, or where I use toms. I mean, a lot of the time I do the tom thing because that's a great place for different atmospheres. I mean, I've only got so much on a regular kit you can use. Uh, and I've if, if quite, a, quite a few of the tracks from those two albums, um, and I am using toms a lot in completely different ways, but they're my extreme contrasts, um, and they seem to work for that particular time. So again, it's about the music bringing things maybe out in you. Um, Charlie, ironically, was one of those songs which just kind of evolved and grew, and um, I never got fed up with Charlie. It was just, one, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful song. Two, he used to play, and I think, you know, the show the climax, and then it'd be, ah, oh, into this lull, you, get your, you can get your breath back and just really settle in. And I just love that feeling of starting it off and the music starts to come, and when it gets to the middle of the song, that climax when it goes up here on the cymbals and it gets very moody, I mean, that was like, like an orgasm for me every time, you know, it really was. It was, it was a beautiful experience. That made him sound corny. That's what I like to feel when I play music, is to just get the most emotion out of every little beat, and that's the real drug, you know, for playing, I think. Was a full moon the last night I was full of bravado. Again, the, the, the song itself dictates quite a, f a movement. I probably tried one or two things a bit more conventional and wasn't quite happy and then found the snare worked well. I think it does in particularly a contrast to the other dynamics that I use with the cymbals and things. There seems to be a very big gap where again if I was just playing the hi-hat instead of that, it would just obviously feel and sound different.
I listen to everything, I think. Um, I don't play in a conventional way as a lot of people expect drummers and bass players to play, or so they say, oh, you want, you want to lay something down with the bass player? I mean, I, if it comes to one or the other, I'd rather lay something down with the person who's leading the song playing rhythm. That's the bottom line, if it was a choice of one or the other. But, you know, I just respond to the overall feel, because that's what it is. You're playing a part of a groove. I mean, it's interesting, like with tempos and things, um, I, you and I were talking earlier on about what we call um, gear changes. So. You know, often you might think, oh, this, slow, this song needs to be a bit faster. So you'll speed it up quite considerably. But it's, it's hard to tell. If you're just going like that, as opposed to, and then as opposed to, the 16 end is really, really fast. So what's my point? My point is I'm listening to everybody. Everyone's playing different kind of rhythms, really. And, and I find my place and space and color, and I try and just lock everybody in. I suppose I'm a bit like the glue in it, if I think about it. Uh, look, I love the V-drums. Um, I mean, I've been playing electronic drums for... since about 1981, 82, I discovered, and that was a couple of years after the ends, and I saw the whole insight to them. And, and I've spent a lot of money and time on getting all the various kits which have come out. Unfortunately, it's not until about the last eight years when the TD20, that was a real turning point, came out with real hats and everything. Now the TD30, which is just a, it's a much more sophisticated version. Very playable, very recordable, very friendly. It's crossed the line at last, you know, and uh, it's a bit how I compare it to like a MIDI keyboard. It's, it's a great tool, you know, and I, I'm a bit surprised that drummers are, seem a bit slow on getting it, really. Um, but that's another story. Oh, you look wonderful, darling, Charlie, pale and deadly still, for heaven's sake, wake up, Charlie.